1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The New Testament talks about salvation in past, present, and future tense. The New Testament shows us that our salvation is something which has already happened for us as believers. Look at Romans 8, 24, Ephesians 2, 5 to 8. Salvation can be spoken of in the past tense. But salvation is also a present reality, and the New Testament speaks about that. For example, Paul in the book of Corinthians, both his letters to the Corinthians, speaks about our ongoing experience of salvation. In 1 Corinthians 1.18 and 2 Corinthians 2.15, Paul talks about the fact that every life is in motion. We are either perishing or we are being saved. Jesus is the deciding factor. Our association to him is what determines for us our salvation or our destruction. Jesus, Paul says, is the dividing line, the defining reality between degeneration and regeneration in our lives day by day. And the book of 1 Peter reflects both the past and present senses of salvation. We can see it even here in the first chapter of 1 Peter. We can see that the believers have been born into an imperishable new life through God's word. Verse 23. We can see that they've been redeemed by Christ's precious blood. Verses 18 and 19. For Peter, there is a past dimension to salvation. But Peter also sees a present sense to the salvation of these believers across Asia. He says that they are receiving the goal of their faith. He says that they're called to live as strangers in the world because the one who called them is holy. They also ought to be holy. He also points at the beginning of chapter 2 to the fact that what they need is pure spiritual nourishment that will allow them to grow up in their salvation. That's chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But I want you to notice here in verses 3 to 5 in particular, and then repeatedly throughout the letter, Peter places a special emphasis on the future hope of the believer. He speaks about waiting for an inheritance, an inheritance that is waiting for us. He writes that a salvation will be revealed in the last hour, verse 5. There's a grace coming to the believers, Peter writes, when Jesus himself returns and announces to the world who he is, verse 13. Peter writes that their hope is ultimately in God, and this is a future hope, testified to by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter is in no way trying to diminish the importance of what God has already done to save them. Nor is he trying to be glib or minimize the importance of what is being worked out in their hearts as he writes the letter to them. But Peter wants to call their attention to the purpose and the aim of both their past and present salvation. Peter is reminding them that the best is still ahead. Thank God for what he has already done. Thank God for the work of Jesus. It is glorious what God has wrought in history. 
And thank God for what he is doing now by the Spirit, building his church, redeeming sinners, changing them, conforming them to the image of his Son. Thank God for his present salvation here and now. But we are looking forward to what God will do. As believers, we are looking to the climax of these things. The fullness of every promise will arrive. The righting of every wrong will finally be accomplished. We will see the issue of every reward and the purification of creation itself into an incorruptible whole. That's what we really long for. It's just like how you can enjoy sitting in the living room, the chatting with friends and family before a holiday meal. The smells waft out of the kitchen. The anticipation builds and builds. And there's real genuine joy in that. But when mom comes in and says it's ready, when the dinner bell rings and you gather around the dinner table, when the drinks are poured and the rolls are passed around, when all of the delicious food is eaten with laughter and joy and compliments to the chef, the slice of pie, the turkey and stuffing and gravy. When we get to enjoy that, we realize this is what we came for. As good as the anticipation was, it was a longing that is satisfied by the meal itself. That is why we look forward to what is coming. So understand this well. We don't anticipate heaven in light of the things we know in this life. We are not to anticipate heaven in the light of the things we know in this life. We are instead to understand this life in light of what God has promised to us as children of heaven. Can I give you an example that's really difficult for me personally to accept? Scripture teaches very clearly that in the life that is to come, we will not have marriage as we know it now. Read Mark chapter 12, verses 24 and 25. Scripture teaches us that there will be no marriage in eternity. And honestly, that makes me sad. That is one of the hardest teachings of Scripture for me to accept. But do you know why that is? It's because I too often think of heaven as merely a bigger, better version of what I know in this life. In my mind, I think, how can it be a good life if my wife isn't part of it as I know her now? I'm trying to see and frame eternity in the light of this world. But what if I saw this world in the light of what is still to come? What if this life is the shadow and the coming life is the real thing? What if the reason that Melody and I will no longer be husband and wife in eternity is because what we will have in the new creation is so much greater and more valuable that I simply cannot imagine it from this side of the veil. While this is just an illustration of our main point, I do think it's worth pausing right here to address our single brothers and sisters within the church family. Do you hear how this doctrine might be an encouragement to you? We have often, as a church, exaggerated the permanence and significance of marriage. And we have done it with only the best of intentions. Still, we are mistaken if we speak of marriage as if it were forever. As the vows state, marriage is merely until death do us part. Eternity will make our years of marriage, precious as they are, gift of God though they are, look like a mere breath. They will seem like the single stroke of a hummingbird's wing. Husbands and wives, honor God and thank him for the season you have by his grace. But remember, this season can never be for you what can only be yours in Christ. And to you singles out there, I am in no way trying to trivialize the loneliness you may feel. I am not trying to say that your heartache can, is inconsequential. Your desires, your hopes, they matter, and they matter to God. However, 
what you are receiving in Christ will make what we know in this world look small and cheap by comparison. Paul says that these light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us a weight of glory that will surpass, surpass them all. Look to 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. How will your days of singleness here stack up next to an eternity of perfect communion in the new heaven and the new earth? Do you see it? As long as we measure heaven by the rod of this world, by the meter stick of this life, we will be forever anchored to this life and its frustrations. But if we are merely strangers here, if we are resident aliens, as Peter says, who belong to another place, and we begin to measure this world with the frankly mind-boggling promises of God, the world that is to come, that is what we've been promised. If we begin to measure this life by that life, we will truly be set free. And you see, only God's Spirit can do that for us. It's only His Spirit that can let us see by faith what our mortal minds are too puny and paltry to perceive. Only He can grant us the strength to trust and obey with the light of eternity shining in our hearts. It's the Spirit that gives us confidence in Christ. Jesus lives, period. Full stop. He is not an idea. He is not a fable. He is not a foil. He is not even a martyr or a figurehead. Jesus is the living King of glory. Because He lives, we also will live. John 14, 19. Peter knew the risen Christ. He saw the risen Christ. And Peter died, literally laying his entire being on the confident hope, the expectation that there was waiting for him an inheritance that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven by the living God, the reigning King of glory. That is what it means to live in this life with the light of eternity shining in our hearts. That is what it means to live with confident expectation of what is yet to come. May God make us people like that. The world need to see people like that. If we want to know joy, if we want to know hope, if we want to know peace, we need to become people who live in the light of eternity, not mired in the things of the here and now. As the New Testament tells us, our salvation has been accomplished. Our salvation is being worked out in us day by day. But oh my goodness, are we looking forward to the fullness of these things? Praise God, they are ours in Christ Jesus. Read the promises of God in Scripture. Read them and think on them. Treasure them. God has given us his word full of promises. Because Jesus has been raised for the dead, we can have confidence in these things. We need to remind one another. We need to talk to one another about what it means to look forward to heaven. We need to become the voice of hope to our brothers who need to hear it. We need to become the voice of encouragement to our sisters who need to be lifted up. We need to be spurring one another on towards God's coming as we complete this message, as we bring it to a close, I want you to open your Bibles and read three passages of Scripture. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 10, read verses 19 to 25. I want you to go to Colossians chapter 3, 12 to 17. And I want you to read John 14, 15 to 20. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 25. Colossians chapter 3, 12 to 17. John chapter 14, 15 to 20. And pray that God would make us people who live in the light of eternity. That we would be a community of faith living with the confident hope that there is kept in heaven for us an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Thanks be to God.